What's up everyone? Sonic has been on a roll with the animated promos. They're not only a sweet bonus, they're appetizers that get you thinking, Oh man, I can't wait to play this! So today, we're looking back on the animated promos from worst to best. Before we start, we're looking into the animated promos, not animated shorts in general. These need to promote a game that's either upcoming or recently released. So Man of the Year doesn't count. But it's still hilarious. Eggman dresses as Sonic and wreaks havoc to make him look bad. We're not going over commercials or intros in games. The promo has to be like a mini movie. I'll be including music videos as long as they're animated. The live action music video by Right Said Fred Wonder Man that advertised Sonic 3 in the UK doesn't count. It is definitely a banger though. These promos will be ranked for how well they build up to their respective games and their overall quality, plot, animation, all that jazz. Hey everyone, real quick I want to say that my debut novel, Shadow of the Chimera Fractured Reunion, is now available. It's a road trip story with a costumed hero traveling alongside a couple of agents, as they encounter the heroes' old friends, a group of serial killers, and more. And my book can also be... A hat. The link's below, and I'm working on the sequel. Now let's dive in and see, worst to best, Sonic Animated Promos! Sonic Colors Rise of the Wisps For the ultimate edition of Sonic Colors, this promo made sure to bring the two new factors into the spotlight, Metal Sonic and the Jade Wisp. This short makes it clear that you don't fight Metal in the game, you race him. He's not looking for a fight, are you? You're looking for a race. It's more or less a retelling of Colors' story. A load wisp tells Sonic and Tails that their friends have been abducted by Eggman, and Sonic breaks them out. While Metal Sonic, in hindsight, was a laughable addition to Colors Ultimate, he's a good fit here. Forcefully using the power of the wisps, in juxtaposition with Sonic being granted permission from them to use their powers. And despite being in most of the 2010s games, I don't think I've seen the intimidating Metal Sonic interacting with the goofy Orbot and Cubot, calling him Big Bro and such. But don't you worry, Big Bro. Can I call you Big Bro? The animation is stellar, perhaps interstellar. Sweet Mountain looks more delicious than ever, and this is the first promo to have full voice acting. On a side note, Kid Higgins, who voiced Tails and Colors, returns for the first time since Lost World. Okay then, would you like to read Eggman's lines? So, why is Rise of the Wisps ranked at the lowest? Well, it does take a while to get the ball rolling. The exposition could have been wrapped up sooner. Even though it's for a souped up version, it is a promo for an 11 year old game. We know what happens in colors, there aren't any surprises in store. And there's that flirt where the Jade Wisp understands what Sonic is talking about. Translator be damned. Wait, you're just making it more interesting for me, aren't you? He says ice cream monkey's banana pie. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Seems you were wrong. If he knows I said it wrong, it means he understands English! Regardless, it is cute and pleasing to the eye, and it represents what's in the updated version of Colors. Overall, a smooth ride. <laughs> Team Sonic Racing Overdrive the Car Racers cartoon gets down to it and shows us how the game plays. Each Wisp, being the items of this game, offer a different power that can either give you a boost or leave another driver in the dust. And teamwork is the most crucial element of Team Sonic Racing, handing items to your buddy and such. Each character has a wide array of expressions when they win or lose. Although Big always has that neutral look no matter what happens, this promo leans on comedy the most, which fits the game. That old wacky racist cartoon from the 60s might have been an inspiration, case in point with Eggman in place of Dick Dastardly, leaving traps for the racers. The soundtrack has a good number of brief covers of old themes, and Crush 40's Green Light Ride? Damn, that's a good song! I love how the animation blends 2D and CG to sell that exhilaration of speed. Quills and ears blowing in the wind, pebbles and dirt launched by the tires going 100 miles per hour. The way the cars are blurs to those standing still. And there's a healthy balance of blistering high-speed driving and slower tranquility. A few things hold it back. Planet Wisp is the only track here. Part 2 could have featured the other circuits like Sanopolis or Casino Park. Team Vector is nowhere to be seen, and that stings when you realize that Blaze, Silver, and Vector have never been in one of these. Team Eggman is incomplete with Metal Sonic and Zavok absent. And the infamous part was Shadow refusing to help Rouge and Omega, his best friends. 
It's even worse than I remember, because All Hail Shadow is playing. I know why it's there. Him doing so was meant to show that you need to be a team player to win. If you ditch your teammates, it'll cost you in the end. But it's in bad taste to give Shadow that role. Why not have Zavok be the anti-friends guy? We could have gotten him and Eggman bickering, that would have been funny. Don't know why Omega was written as a dunce. Why didn't I bring that up before? All that aside, it's a solid and upbeat promo that gets you in the mood to race. Chow in space. At first, I wasn't going to put this here, but in the end credits, we see the Chow group driving in Team Sonic Racing. It counts! Those Chow in space movie posters we've seen in a few games, which were just meant to be a small joke, came to fruition in this mini-movie. Definitely the shortest and most adorable of the promos. A neutral Chow is an action hero in a heated dogfight with a dark Chow. In space! In their dream, the Space Dream has a grainy VHS filter, alluding to the early 2000s when Sonic Adventure 2 was released and when video cassettes were common back then. In the Chow Garden though, the picture is clean, telling us we are not in the dream. As they sleepwalk, Sonic is trying to keep them out of harm's way while Eggman, dressed as Santa Claus because holiday special, attempts to steal presents. That fiend! It might also be the most violent promo since it's implied the Chow yanks Sonic's nose out of his face. Yes, it doesn't show much of how Team Sonic Racing plays since this came out at the tail end of 2019, tagging the big game of that year, which was already released half a year prior. But it's a Chow cartoon, I don't have it in me to rank it lower. Plenty of Easter eggs and charm to warm any fan's heart. It's Chow in Space! Sonic Mania Adventures the first in a consistent line of animated promos. This miniseries starts off with classic Sonic returning to his home dimension right after helping the Resistance defeat Eggman, and finds that his Eggman is up to his old tricks again. The more goes on, the more characters are added. Episode 1 exclusively features Sonic and Eggman, Episode 2 as Sonic and Tails reunite, huh. Episode 3 is all about Knuckles, they couldn't help themselves, being incredibly protective of the Master Emerald. Episode 4 is easily the best. Mighty and Ray team up and deal with Metal Sonic, who gives us a taste of how ruthless he is, threatening to hurt Ray unless Mighty surrenders his Chaos Emerald. On the topic of promotion, Mania Adventures shows us what makes Mighty and Ray unique when it comes to gameplay. Ray can glide in the air, and Mighty is spike-proof. If you'd like to know what I think of Mighty and Ray, check this video out. Episode 5 has all five heroes in Eggman's base battling Super Metal Sonic. Who should have had gold plating? Mecha Sonic had the right idea. This is a very simple story, and that suits Mania since that game basically didn't have one. It was mostly stage hopping filler. The animation is one to one with the 2D cutscenes of Mania, both made by the same crew as Tyson Hess as director. I really like how all the characters interact with each other. Ray is so freaking cute asking Knuckles if he's seen Mighty. The way Sonic and Eggman bounce off each other tickles my funny bone. And speaking of Eggman, he has the best facial expressions. You can tell the animators love drawing him the most. Out of all the times we've seen classic Sonic since 2011, he has the most emotion here. He isn't permanently happy or treated like someone's benign, mute little brother. We see him annoyed, angry, a tad smug. It's okay to have some negative emotions every now and then. It shows that you're three-dimensional. And since everyone is mute, him not talking isn't off-putting like it was in Generations or Forces. This promo does lose me a bit when it comes to Knuckles, who is crazy exaggerated here. An explosive blockhead who's willing to throw down with anyone who even looks at the Master Emerald. And it's implied that he once again thinks Sonic is after the Emerald. At least he doesn't punch Sonic and unintentionally give Eggman the upper hand. It's kind of amusing that this is meant to promote Mania while being a continuation of it, but basically replaces Encore mode in Mania Plus. In both scenarios, Sonic is warped out of the ending of Forces, but they each branch off into different narratives, so both can't happen in one timeline. Or can they? References are plenty throughout this miniseries. Callbacks to stages, covers of old songs, returning badniks, it's a hefty list. It'd be foolish not to mention that there's also an epilogue where Amy Rose finds the trashed Metal Sonic and brings him back to Eggman. It's an endearing Christmas special. It is too bad that Amy wasn't a playable character in Mania. At least we have Origins and Superstar to make up for that. A familiar and fun tribute to the classic era that puts the callback game on your mind. By the Mania, for the Mania. This was the trickiest one to place, so I think being right in the middle works best, yeah? Okay, three, two, one, come on! Enflo loves Shadow the Hedgehog. 
This Japanese music video by Mflow remixing their song Tripod Baby has a hip hop group and singer Lisa partying in their spaceships until Shadow attacks with his own Toonami spaceship. Following this, everyone winds up on an asteroid dance floor with dozens of gold men. Look at Shadow go! After a hyperspeed chase in a digital landscape, Mflow and Lisa are trapped in a hollow cube as Shadow laughs at them. What just happened? This is trippy as hell. There's no way to look past the clunky CGI models and wobbly animation. And what's with that mushroom? Is it on mushrooms? To be fair, this was in 2005. I was going to brush this off as one of those music videos that are barely connected to what they're promoting and end up doing random things. We do see a few snippets of the game's pre-rendered cutscenes, but no Black Doom, Gun, or Space Call in the arc. However, the more I watch it, the clearer I see a stronger connection to the game. Shadow glows blue and uses cast control like in the stages. He's depicted as villainous while pursuing Enflo and Lisa. In the game, he can be a bad guy in a few endings. There's a cyber area reminiscent of Digital Circuit and Mad Matrix, outer space is heavily prevalent, and most importantly, the mood of this video reflects the lighter side of Shadow, both the character and the game. Shadow of Five is in all grunge and darkness. There is some levity and optimism here. You just have to dig deep. Finally, justice is served! If what you say is true, then I will respectfully accept my fate. You mean to tell me that you really don't remember a thing? But I just need some time to uncover the real truth. Black Doom is in here since Shadow is free from all that strife. It's colorful escapism for him. He can cut loose and dance. He can be elsewhere. And there's the song Tripod Baby, which is so lively and positive. It resonates with Shadow's softer nature. There's also a surge of confidence to it. Hearing this combined with parts of the game gives you that I can beat the darkness feeling. It clicked really well in the commercials. <laughs> Shadow the I can picture this song being in the end credits of the pure or semi-hero stories. Tripod Baby has been experimented with by fans a few times. Maria loved this planet. I will not let you destroy it. You know what? I'll do one too. <laughs> I have zero problems calling Tripod Baby one of Shadow's songs. Even though the music video is bizarre, there's such a likability to it. It's Shadow the Hedgehog, baby! Sonic Superstars, Trio of Trouble. Straight to the point, we have the hero party with Amy joining in. The four are in a temple scuffling with a returning Fang the Hunter sniper aboard the Marvelous Queen, which has the same features from Triple Trouble, like its flight and drill mode. And it's gotten quite an upgrade. The temple is reminiscent of the special stages where you fought Fang in Triple Trouble, and it is a refreshing change of pace after the admittedly played out green tropical setting from Mania Adventures. The heroes don't overstay their welcome, as the rest of the promo focuses on the trio of antagonists. Fang, Eggman, and newcomer Trip the Sungazer. We see how dysfunctional and argumentative the group is, unlike the heroes who are in sync and well coordinated with each other. Acknowledging the co op and superstars. Very Godzilla vs. Gigan esque. While Gigan and King Ghidorah argue, Godzilla and Anguirus work together as best buds. The first half is really a dream of Fangs, or should I say nightmare given how it ends. The second half has the crew exploring an ancient temple, escaping death traps, tangling with a giant snake, who appears in Sand Sanctuary Zone, and discovering a mural, like what we see in Golden Capital Zone. And this mural foreshadows the true final boss of superstars, the ferocious looking Black Dragon. The personality traits of all three characters are easy to see. Eggman is narrow minded about what could potentially give him an advantage in his next world domination scheme. Fang is all about himself, looking out for his own safety and rewards. Trip is the odd one out as the quiet nice one, feeling bad for the flower trampled by Eggman, and the snake after being knocked out by Fang. She's also very supportive, case in point when she hands Fang the missing component for the Marvelous Queen. Her shy and lovable personality matches what's in Superstars, and the promo practically tells you you don't fight her in the game. If there was a boss fight, it would have been contrived. Hi stranger, my name's Trip. <laughs> It does make you wonder why the friendly guardian of the North Star Islands would help these two, but she contributes a balance to the trio. It's not all bad guys. Like with Knuckles and Triple Trouble, not a villain, just misled. 
The promo also shows how protective her durable helmet is, which also hides her face. Want to know what she looks like? Play the game! While re-watching it, I noticed how the presentation has really stepped it up. Stronger lighting and shading compared to Mania Adventures. Highlights the co-op of superstars, gives us big hints on what's in the game, it's the only promo to star the villains, we have an homage to a Game Gear title for once, and it's the first promo of this countdown to lead into its respective game story and set the stage. Or stages. Sonic, Night of the Werehog, made by Marza Animation Planet, who worked on Sonic Unleashed. This promo is our first and so far only Halloween special in the countdown, taking place at a haunted house where ghosts love to snap pictures of frightened trespassers. Before looking this up on Sonic Wiki, I didn't know the ghosts had names. Su, U, and La. The former two appear in side missions in the 360 and PS3 versions of Unleashed. These guys simp after La, who has a hobby of collecting photos of people shrieking in fear. When Sonic and Chip enter the house during a thunderstorm, we get a montage of Sue and Inu trying to one-up each other as they scare Chip over and over again. Then Sonic joins in, but only once. Oops. When Law wants a picture of Sonic scared, Sue and Inu are on the move, possessing night armor and cornering their guests. Good thing there's no curse on Sonic, and I bet the Earth being split into pieces recently has absolutely zero effect on- <laughs> What the hell was that? This might be the best Werehog transformation sequence. Sonic shuddering as it begins and staring at the full moon while the unassuming ghosts are ready with their cameras. Chip watching in horror, the shockwave of the change pushing the ghosts back and has them accidentally taking embarrassing photos of themselves. Sonic wasn't even trying. If I had to nitpick, Chip should be used to seeing this by now. And in the game, the full moon is irrelevant. Sonic transforms when the sun goes down. So this can't be canon with Unleashed, but it's a standalone animated short. I'm okay with it. Up till now, this has been a supernatural comic Comedy. But after Su and Inu team up for some payback, it's a supernatural action flick. Su and Inu fuse into the green ox-like Baker, charging at Sonic, firing on all cylinders. It's Wolfman vs. Ghost. Baker's as strong as the Werehog, can be intangible at will, and able to turn invisible. But the camera can be used to find him, hinting on the uncanny camera as a method of exorcism in Unleashed. And of course, the fight builds up to the promise of beat em up combat in the game. This is an awesome fight scene, and it's a little disappointing that you never fight Baker in the game. That would have been a fun side boss battle. The way Sonic is written in both forms is on point. At ease, impressed, likes to relax, slightly irritated, really irritated, and cocky. The animation and textures are phenomenal. The rain on Sonic and Chip, the light reflecting off the photographs, the wide range of facial expressions, just about everything the ghosts do. And this was in 2008! Man, Marza knocked it out of the park. I freaking love Night of the Werehog. An homage to classic Halloween stories, showcasing how the Werehog fights, which looks damn good, and helping back the companionship between Sonic and Chip. This duo is the heart of Unleashed, and it's right to have that here, too. Night of the Werehog was referenced in a spirit battle in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Incredible! And last year, it got a sequel starring the ghosts. Ghost Tale. It's pretty good. Give it a watch. You can't deny that this is an animated Halloween gem. Sonic Frontier is prologue, Divergence. Hot damn, this one rocked my socks off. I was not expecting it to be this good. Knuckles isn't the main character of Sonic Frontiers. He's not even playable in the base version, but he did get a short film all to himself. Thank you. Divergence explains how he ended up in Starfall Islands. It has a tame start, reminiscent of the beginning of Knuckles' story in Sonic Adventure 1, guarding the Master Emerald, thinking about his ancestors, and inquiring on some unanswered questions. Which Frontiers fills in? After the rain clears, Knuckles does some patrolling in Sky Sanctuary, and I really want to play a treasure hunting variation of this stage. The floating ruins have never been this breathtaking. He inner monologues that even though he's been exploring Angel Island his whole life, there are still things he hasn't discovered yet. We find the Chow happily living there, and Knuckles being a guardian to them, giving them fruit, making them feel safe. Knuckles stumbles upon a gear and unknowingly activates a portal. Intent? The portal brings him into the dreaded cyberspace, where an army of robots built by the ancients pounce at him. Oh, an ambush, huh? 
your funeral. Oh, this fight scene. The animation of Knuckles fighting them is so fluid and has that ooh. The techno music sounds like the mini-boss themes in the game. There is a brief appearance of Sage, who looks villainous, like she is at first in the game. Show of hands, who else thought she would be a boss battle? Divergence ends with Knuckles stuck in his red cyber prison bubble on Ares Island, inner monologuing that he does need help sometimes. Soon enough in Frontiers, Sonic will break him out. This has my favorite take on Knuckles. Peaceful, stoic, brave, caring, and just damn cool! I was so happy to play as him in Final Horizon, at last coming full circle with a playable Knuckles in Frontiers. This promo does an excellent job in preparing you for Frontiers. The tone is consistent with the game's atmosphere, ranging from serene to intense. It shows you the enemies you'll face, Sage is sure to meet you, and the mystery of Starfall Islands will be on your mind. Frontiers was meant to be the flagship title, starting off a new era. Divergence is the red carpet for that flagship title. Important to note that this is the first promo to be taken seriously, and the first one to properly segue into its game story. Watch this right before playing Frontiers. It'll hype you up even more. For a couple of years, Divergence has been my number one. But then... Wonder Man. Sonic X Shadow Generations, Dark Beginnings. By episode one alone, I knew this was going to be the best. Dark Beginnings is the most dramatic, emotional, exciting, and beautifully animated of the promos. Diving into Shadow's origin, while leading up to a standalone story in Generations. Sonic's upcoming birthday is mentioned. Shadow has the Yellow Chaos Emerald. Eggman has data on the Time Eater, the samurai-themed egg ponds that were just in Aquarium Park, which was in the most recent of Sonic's journeys, pre-generations. Episode 1 truly immerses us in the Space Colony arc 50 years ago, starting off with a subversion of that first-person chase sequence reminiscent of SA2 in Shadow 05. Shadow isn't bringing Maria to another room because they're fleeing from gun soldiers. Instead, she's happily bringing him to a room to see the awe-inspiring view of the Aurora Borealis below the arc. During this, a symptom of her neuroimmune deficiency syndrome starts acting up, something we never saw in the games. The first episode is a contorted flashback that gradually becomes more twisted with the emergence of Emerald kicking it all off. Or to be more precise, the Gazoid. After Sonic Battle, we look back on Emerald as the well-meaning robot who developed a personality and sense of justice. But 50 years prior, that is not the case. He's simply the Gazoid, a war robot. We gotta talk about the fight between Shadow and the Gazoid. It's only 20 seconds, but good god the fight choreography! Knowing the Gazoid, he copies the abilities of his opponents, punching, kicking, and blocking the same way Shadow does. Shadow uses the spin attack, the Gazoid imitates that. Learning as he fights. Shadow lands a solid punch, which mysteriously causes the Gazoid to shatter like glass. At this point, Shadow knows that something's off. He falls from the arc and into jailed Robotnik's cell on Prison Island. The Professor is pushed further away from Shadow. No matter how fast he is, he can never reach him. This is Gerald right before his execution by gun. Despite Shadow being the ultimate life form, he couldn't save his creator. It all culminates in a red sky, like when the Black Arms invaded. Maria has been killed by gun, giving us Kirk Thornton Shadow's first ever Maria scream. Maria! To cap it off, Black Doom emerges from the hellish red sky and takes hold of Shadow. Back in Shadow 05, Doom intruded himself into Shadow's painful memories as a sickening way of manipulating him. How accurate to first see him this way. As the nightmare ends, Shadow awakens with a panic attack and uses an emerald-fueled chaos spear on a tree out of PTSD. He has a suspicion that Black Doom has returned, causing him to go to the Ark, where it all began. And that was just Episode 1. Episode 2 starts with another flashback, introducing us to the future gun commander, with Maria name-dropping Abe. Shadow is coming to terms with the fact that the Black Arms DNA is inside him. Generations will make double sure of that. As he stares at the lone Death Leech in the capsule, his eyes convey his disgust in himself. The cinematography is on point in translating his self-loathing and sense of isolation. As he calls himself ugly and heartless like the Death Leech before him, Maria is blanketed in darkness, as if Shadow is subconsciously keeping her out of the picture. On screen is only Shadow and the larva of the Black Arms. But with a hug from Maria, the light returns, and the healing piano piece plays. You have a big heart. It may be difficult for you to express it, but I know that deep down, you really do care. About me. About everyone. While she's giving the speech, it's much harder to see the larva. In a transition to the present, Maria alludes that Shadow will meet more people he can trust. Taking us to Eggman's old neon light loving pyramid base from SA2, with Rouge and Omega joining in. That's right, it's time for some Team Dark action! Rouge utilizing her martial arts and ability to fly, the headstrong Omega blasting any other Eggman robot in his way. I 
The Egg Breaker from Shadow of Five comes back as an independent mech, and Shadow saves Rouge from being crushed by it. We've come a long way these past five years. The team demolishes the mech together in a sick fight scene that takes me back to Sonic Heroes. Rouge and Omega were at the base gathering data for Gun, while Shadow was there for a spacecraft to go to the Ark. But Eggman only had the one. Rouge promises Shadow a rocket ship at a Gun base, segueing into the final episode. During an elevator ride, Rouge mentions Gun funding Shadow's creation and stealing him for five decades. It's common knowledge for us older fans, but it informs the younger newcomers about Shadow's past. How many 10-year-olds today have played SA2? When Gun's Blue Falcon is on the prowl, Shadow and Omega take it on in the last fight scene of the promo. Shadow redirects missiles at the Blue Falcon, sips around with the Chaos Snap, and uses Chaos Control to freeze time, both of which are in generations. With the flying mech heavily damaged, the gun pilot's eject lever is jammed, but Shadow activates it and saves his life. Like Maria said, he has a heart. Shadow heads back to the rocket after the Blue Falcon has been trashed. I wanted to destroy it. <laughs> Unfortunately, gun security is set to shoot the rocket down, but... This is Commander Abraham Tower. All forces stand down. The Gun Commander. Abe Tower lets Shadow go to space and acknowledges that he would have helped if Shadow asked. Talk about character development. Rue shares with Abe Eggman's data on the Time Eater as Shadow flies to the Ark while... While imagining what could have been if... Maria was never killed. And she's on Earth with Shadow. In the same cliff from the first episode that has the white flowers. And... Stop that. That life was taken from me long ago. I need to focus on the mission at hand. Setting his mind straight, Shadow flies to the Ark, ready to once again face Black Doom and other familiar foes in his next journey. Dark Beginnings is without a doubt the best animated Sonic promo. I don't see anything beating this. The mix of 2D and CG animation is nothing short of jaw-dropping, and it delivers on some cinematic scenes. I want to see this on the big screen. I don't care that it's only 12 minutes. Everyone is written with so much care and respect. I missed Maria. She's largely known as a plot device to advance Shadow's story, but Dark Beginnings went the extra mile to reassure us that she was a person with aspirations and wisdom. Sharing her love of the Earth with her best friend, showing disapproval at Ave for calling Shadow a freak, telling Shadow that he's not a monster. I adore Stephanie Shea's glowing performance as Maria. The first time we saw Maria in SA2 and Shadow of Five is during her death scene. Shocking, yes, but Dark Beginnings introduces her in a peaceful scene before the tragedy strikes, and when it does, it really is a gut punch. This is the most devastating version of it. Rouge has her sly and playful disposition like always, but has her genuine moments too. Omega provides the appropriate amount of comic relief, especially when the action ramps up, all just by being himself. For the first time, I'm happy to see the Gun Commander. As a child, he was a brat for being so surly a Shadow, not too different from what we've seen in 05. But now he's finally free from that hate, and recognizes Shadow as the hero who saved the Earth from Black Doom. All is forgiven, Abe. And Shadow. This could rival 06's take on him. The promo shows us that at his core, he is a good guy who's just as sensitive as we are. Afraid, disturbed, and depressed, but also honest, vulnerable, compassionate, and a little upbeat. 05 ended with him foregoing his past and living for the future, but that pain will always be there, and he needs to keep it at bay to focus on what's ahead of him. So it is faithful to that ending's message. Kirk Thornton is an excellent Shadow. He never gave a bad performance as him. The dialogue he's been given to work with was just sour every now and then. No malicious intent on the writers or Sega. Don't harass anybody. With the right script, he can hit a home run with this role. I hope this promo does its part in ending that exaggerated anti-hero image. Three-dimensional with a touch of the dark isn't the same as bloated angst. I don't know what else to say. I love Dark Beginnings. A masterfully done animated short that tugs at your heartstrings and makes you want to play Shadow Generations like nobody's business. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out Shadow of the Chimera Fractured Reunion, and please like, subscribe, and comment which promo is your favorite. Till next time!